My name is Hans van der Heide. I have an architectural design studio in Amsterdam, mainly working on housing and urban design. I want to say some words on the social housing project Persoonshaven that we designed for the Feyenoord district in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. The houses obviously suggest an adaptation of a common Dutch late 19th century speculative house type. However, the amendments of its imagery, spatial organization, detail and structure originate from standardized contemporary local construction techniques and from current regulations and space standards as well. Both the typology and the construction methodology will be presented in the framework of Martin Steinmann's characterization of traditionalist design as practiced by the Danish architect Kai Fisker. In his essay, The Tradition of Objectivity and the Objectivity of Tradition, published in 1997, the Swiss architect and theorist Martin Steinmann aptly reduced traditionally designed practice to be, quote, simplistically divided into two categories. The first is related to the work it takes to create forms, while the second is related to the values with which the forms are invested. In one, the idealistic view, tradition congeals into a set of forms that connote tradition and that cannot be changed without destroying its ground. In the other, tradition is something that is constant in flux." Unquote. To Fisker, Steinmann argued, quote, tradition is not related to an image to be preserved and certainly not to the essence of a people reflected in that image. It is related to the material and intellectual conditions in which architects work. This includes the decision to use new means if they are superior to the old ones, but also not to use those means that are new or connote modernity but are not better." Unquote. In other words, according to Steinmann, Fisker focused on the working methods as known to large groups of people within construction culture rather than on static ideals. Persons have a typology sits in a long tradition. The accepted view is that it originates in the 17th century. When Dutch urban dwellings were not built in timber anymore, they were typically designed as row housing with low bearing brick cross walls. The width of those housing was usually given by the size of the plots, which in turn were adjusted to the maximum span of timber beams, around six meter. The profile of those beams was often reduced by adding a secondary load-bearing wall. The so-called sleeper wall separated the main living room from the circulation spaces which contained the entrance, the hallway, the stairs and where present also the kitchens and the bathrooms. This type, initially used by the wealthy elite, developed into the speculative multifamily model in which the circulation bay served several small units with or without alcoves. The width of that bay allowed the two front doors sitting next to one another. This made it possible to separate the ground floor spaces from those on the upper floors. Precisely these two doors are the background for the variety within the type. This type of the house with two doors manifested itself in different fashions. In the late 19th century it was the common house type in the west of the Netherlands. The counties of Utrecht, North and South Holland mainly, suited for speculative mass housing with as many as eight or ten units per house. In such cases, one of the doors would be used as access for the upper six or eight units, while the other access would lead to one or two units or even to a shop or a workspace. Although differences in the image were minimal, it was not uncommon for spec builders to sign their buildings by using their own carved headstones above the windows. But contrary to these workers' housing, the same principle was applied in more unique celebrations of the type for middle-class houses. In such cases, the number of units was reduced to just two stacked maisonettes or flats. Contrary to the workers' housing, the imagery of the middle-class variant was diversified. In both cases, though, the two front doors consistently marked the width of the circulation bay introducing an asymmetric gesture within the otherwise repetitive facade. There were sound reasons to reintroduce the house with two doors in Feyenoord. 
in the 19th century, the type had dominated the speculative urbanization of the area. Apart from urban and aesthetic considerations, houses with two doors containing two stacked maisonettes had proved clear benefits in avoiding difficult to manage circulation spaces, such as collective access decks and run up staircases. The street, or so was the assumption, regained its traditional status as the space for navigation and meeting. The street was assumed to be still the space where its users know, accept and enjoy the codes of public life. The design could not be directly copied from its precursors though. Over more than a century, building regulations had changed, requiring wide doors, meter cupboards and turning spaces for wheelchairs, etc. Modern concrete floors do not limit the spans of the houses anymore. The sleeper wall disappeared. Once it sufficed to separate the staircases by simple 70 mm thick walls. But today sound insulation regulations require 300 mm thick walls. Therefore the two front doors needed to be separated in the ground floor plan, introducing a symmetric facade with the kitchen of the lower maisonette in between. It was as if the type finally lived up to its latent, symmetric, orderly aspirations. Because of its lack of direct historic references, this updated house with two doors acquired a sense of generality in its image, avoiding any pre-established suggestion of wealth or lack of prosperity, and suiting current emancipatory ambitions within the social housing realm. The facade development followed a comparable modus operandi. The facades are quite evidently made up from bricks, and again, what at first glance seems rooted in architectural tradition is actually different from centuries-old Dutch housing. The outer wall has developed from a monolithic structure into an assembly of brick sleeves with insulation and a cavity in between. In 1993, the German architect Hans Kohlhoff interrogated the resulting problem of tectonic plausibility in his essay The Myth of the Architectonic. It was 20 years after the oil crisis. Buildings were wrapped into insulation material and clad with all sorts of finishing materials. The cold bridge modernism which had been unveiled before no longer worked. According to Kohlhoff, the separation of the outer layer of the facade from the main structure induced solutions which were perhaps structurally sound, but less acceptable to the eye. In his words, the feel for the architectonic was at stake, whether a house, quote, ultimately leaves the impression of solidity that gives me the feeling of being elevated, or whether it constantly confronts me with details that call the house as a whole into question. In that components become independent, and I have to fear that everything will collapse like a house of cards, unquote. Meanwhile, it should be added, the meaning of the word joint is at odds with its etymological origin. Today the joint stands for separating building components rather than putting them together or joining them. Compared to the aesthetic of the three-dimensional joint patterns in the stonework of Palladio's Renaissance villas, contemporary joints easily remain strict technical necessities. They are there to make possible the thermal movement of the outer facade layer disconnected from the main structure. Additionally, joints may be needed to separate different materials, which are supplied and built by different subcontractors. Kolhoff again, quote, maybe the silicon gun was the invention with the most impact on the second half of the 20th century, unquote. Obviously uninterested in Kolhoff's objections, the Dutch architect Willem Jan Neutelings put matters on edge by stating that his buildings are born naked, and then dressed up according to the prevailing insights. Quote, the pattern of the materials may vary. One season it might be checks, the next polka dots. Unquote. Facades, viewed in Neutelings' way, are consumer goods contradicting notions of sustainability, longevity, and the appropriation by their owners. At Persons half of the response to the situation was the design of a robust diagram. In that diagram of the house, the plans, the section and the main facade are strongly interdependent. 
The facade is reciprocal in its relation to the structure, the geometry of that, and the type. Its image reflects the tectonic possibilities and restrictions of its main materials, in this case, brick. The front facade has a regular rhythm of vertical windows, which is slightly modified by result-like brick features on its central axis. These results, projecting the size of half a brick, introduce a degree of relief, which was common in the facades of row housing of the past. The vertical expansion joints are articulated architecturally by a row of bricks on edge, marking the load-bearing cross walls. In methodological terms, the diagram is the stable point of departure for further design development. On the one hand, defining the principal integration of design solutions to different and possibly unrelated requirements. On the other hand, allowing space for negotiation in deciding on its buildability. In this process of negotiation and design development, Dutch standard details have been accepted wherever possible. Only if appropriate, slight amendments have been introduced. The standard timber sections of the windows are an example. They appear thinner than they really are because they are partly hidden behind the bricks of the facade. The back of the projecting brickwork of the results follow the general grid lines of the brickwork and it's easy to construct. Timber battens have been added to standard industrial front doors. Deliberately, the thinness of steel railings has been exaggerated to add fine details in the facade, which otherwise follows the chunkier size of the human hand. Bricks, timber frames, sills, roof edges, and so on. The steel sections have been bent to form curves. Welding was excluded, again with cost-limiting effects. Unfortunate or not, at least in Dutch social housing practice, the micromanagement of the construction site by architects is a phenomenon of the past. That is not to say that handcraft has disappeared from the construction industry altogether. The question is rather where handcraft is located within the construction industry today. Therefore, the skills of carpenters producing the formwork necessary for the prefabricated concrete was embraced as a mechanism to manage the side works from a distance. Roof edges, copings, sills and gargoyles were drawn into the architectural realm and their relatively complicated shapes were eventually produced with great precision and care. Gargoyles, being required by Dutch regulations and normally specified by structural engineers in technical terms, acquired an ornamental quality. Hans Kohlhoff might argue that they are tectonic details of the facade. Both the concrete and the steelwork presuppose a high degree of expertise in the factory. Quality management by the architect is restricted to issuing specifications and form drawings and the eventual assessment of production drawings and samples. Contrastingly, the brickwork shells profit from the skills of the bricklayers, which is still widely available to the Dutch construction site itself. Brickwork is very much a bulk product and brick facades are cheap to produce. The design question is how to influence such normative practice. At Persoonshaven several changes to this practice were proposed. Within the lower priced range of bricks, a nuanced factory-made quasi hand-formed brick was selected. Applied in a random bond, the horizontal joints were raked and deeply recessed, whilst the vertical joints were minimized in size. The results in the facade planes are a deep orange tone and a strong texture. The tile bond of the results contribute further to the avoidance of bulk production impressions. One can argue that architecture is always an act of limitation. The Persoonshaven project illustrates a design practice which tries to operate within the given practice of Dutch construction culture. The design optimized and criticized matters rather than it tries to neglect or overhaul the culture in which it was conceived. The use of available typological and construction knowledge anticipated on affordability, buildability, acceptability and sustainability. All such choices provide analogies to buildings of the past, rather than precise copies of those. The analogy is different from the literal imitation in its manipulation of historic precedents. By means of 
conclusion, it is worth quoting Steinmann at length. Quote, the essence of Danish architecture was once explained by the two types of people who inhabit the country. They are farmers, and farmers distrust new things. But they are also sailors, and sailors love to bring home foreign things. The history of Danish architecture is the history of foreign ideas that have influenced the traditions in the country. This image of the farmer and the sailor, which is more than just a metaphor here, addresses a fundamental condition of tradition. It is dependent on the new that it cannot produce itself, just as the new is dependent on tradition. It makes no sense, therefore, to want to abolish that opposition existing between them. They condition each other in this opposition. In other words, tradition is only possible as a critical tradition within this opposition." Unquote. Martin Steinmann's view on Kai Fisker's praxis comes from his book Gold Form Fort. Does the title suggest an agenda, a strive for the stark form, perhaps? Although the Persons have a design process is clearly familiar to Fisker's attitude and design methods, the form or the image was not conceived beforehand. That stark form, if overly present in the first place, is precluded by the diagram of the house, with the interdependence of the plan, the section and the facade. Form is as much a consequence of a cultural reality as it represents an ideal.